I'm Greg Dalton. I'm Ariana Brocious. And this is Climate One. So Donald Trump is headed back to the White House in January. And to be clear, he is a major threat to the global climate. With Trump back in office, it will be even harder to meet U.S. and global goals to reduce emissions that are fueling severe fires, droughts, and storms. Yeah, it's been a rough couple of weeks for climate folks. As most of us remember, the first time Trump was in office, he withdrew the U.S. from the Paris Climate Agreement, which is the most meaningful piece of collective climate action ever. His administration even removed the words climate change and carbon from a bunch of federal websites. Right. And he rolled back a staggering number of environmental safeguards. The Sabin Center for Climate Law at Columbia University kept a running tally. They called it the deregulation tracker. The count stands at 176. And that list includes all kinds of things, like rolling back limits on emissions and harmful pollutants, disbanding the Climate Science Advisory Committee, and approving the Keystone XL pipeline. Trump also appointed former industry executives to run the very government agencies that are supposed to regulate those industries. Myron Ebel, who helped lead a transition team in Trump's first term, said recently about the second Trump term, quote, we're not going to worry about emissions anymore. We're not going to worry about emissions. That's just, ooh, I don't know what to make of that. It could have really dramatic consequences. The climate journalism outlet Carbon Brief found that Trump's re-election could erase more than five years of global progress made by deploying renewable energy. Plus, U.S. policy and behavior helped set the tone for other countries. The United States, of course, has not necessarily been a good faith actor when it comes to, to climate. Earlier this year, we talked with Emma Shortus of the Australia Institute. And so while certainly sent a signal internationally withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, it was also very convenient, I think, for nations like Australia, which is a, a effectively a, a, a petro state, because it allowed nations like mine to hide behind the kind of egregious climate policies of the Trump administration to suggest that, you know, our policies were positive for climate action, that we were doing a lot, especially compared to the United States. And it wasn't just Australia. I think it's fair to say that the mere fact of Trump in the White House gave a certain sense of permission to leaders like Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil to increase deforestation of the Amazon. That alone had huge climate impacts that will last a long time. Yeah, the ripple effects of his second term could be huge. And we'll talk about them in future episodes. But today, our focus is more global. Distinguished delegates, dear friends, welcome to Azerbaijan. Welcome to COP29. This week, the nations of the world are meeting to discuss climate policy and priorities. COP29, the 29th meeting of the Conference of Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, that is a mouthful, opened this week in Baku, Azerbaijan. If it's not been top of mind for you recently, I get it. But the COP meeting is a big deal. It's the only place where virtually every country in the world gathers to work out what each of them will do to address climate change. It's a two-week frenzy of talks that culminates in a collective agreement, but one that notably is non-binding. These annual conferences can be contentious and frustrating, but they can also be exciting and lead to some surprising breakthroughs. Yeah, like the Paris Agreement of 2015. President Obama played a critical role in those negotiations. We'll talk about that history later in the show. Simon Steele is executive secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the organization that manages the UN's whole climate process, including the COP. His own neighborhood on the Caribbean island of Karakou was destroyed two years ago by Hurricane Beryl. Here he is speaking this week at the opening of COP29 with a photo showing a member of his community. In July this year, this was us standing in all that remained of her home. At 85, Florence has become one of the millions of victims of runaway climate change this year alone. And there are people like Florence in every country on earth, knocked down and getting back up again. This UNFCCC process is the only place we have to address the rampant climate crisis. 
and to credibly hold each other to account to act on it. Simon Steele went on to challenge every delegate to take personal responsibility for the impact of their actions at the conference. In these halls, we negotiate on specific pieces of the puzzle each year. So let's make this real. Do you want your grocery and energy bills to go up even more? Do you want your country to become economically uncompetitive? Do you really want even further global instability costing precious life? Ooh, that is really powerful. Yet the recent U.S. election is casting a long shadow on the proceedings. The U.S. is sending a delegation led by John Podesta, who's President Biden's global representative on climate. But he's representing a lame duck administration. Any proposals he puts forward are unlikely to be taken seriously. And every other country knows that anything Podesta says today can be undone by Trump in less than 10 weeks. So coming together around some sort of agreement this year will be even more challenging. And these conventions operate on a consensus model. Pretty much every country in the world has to sign on to any final agreement. There are no mandates. That makes for a painfully slow process. Think about how long it takes to get a bunch of friends to agree on where to go to dinner. Then imagine you're not all friends. And then imagine you need to get nearly 200 countries representing billions of people to agree on where everyone's going to go for dinner. And what's going to be on the menu, where every ingredient is coming from, and most importantly, who's going to pay for it. Exactly. It comes down to money. Who's going to pay for it? And how we're going to pay for it is the biggest question of all. In recent years, we've seen growing gaps between the money needed by developing nations and the money actually delivered by rich countries. And let's not forget, those rich countries are responsible for most of the emissions devastating the planet. Money has become so important to addressing the climate crisis that this year's COP is being called the Finance COP. And just to get a little bit more specific here, when people at these meetings talk about finance, they're really talking about three distinct buckets of money. First, they're talking about money for mitigation. That means money to cut future emissions. So think about financing to help countries replace coal-fired power plants with solar farms. Second, they're talking about money for adaptation. It's looking increasingly clear that the world is blowing past the 1.5 degree target set by the Paris Agreement. So we'll need to spend big bucks on adapting to more extreme weather. Think higher seawalls and more firefighters. And third, there's a bucket of money referred to as the Loss and Damage Fund. The idea here is that billions of people have already lost lives and livelihoods to devastation they didn't cause. And the developed countries that put most of the climate pollution into the air should have to pay for that damage. And all of that's going to add up to trillions of dollars. So fixing this mess will be expensive. And not fixing it or delaying it further is going to be even more expensive. Still, it's kind of hard to imagine rich countries paying poor countries just out of the goodness of their hearts. Right. Very few elected officials want to send money to people who don't vote for them. And so the majority of the climate finance to poorer countries has come in the form of loans. And because poor countries pay much higher interest rates than rich countries, these loans often make poor countries even poorer and rich countries even richer. It's a cycle known as the debt trap. Here's U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres speaking at COP29 earlier this week. And this is a story of avoidable injustice. The rich cause the problem the poor pay the highest price. Oxfam finds the richest billionaires emit more carbon in an hour and a half than the average person does in a lifetime. Climate finance is not charity. It's an investment. Climate action is not optional. It's an imperative. Both are indispensable to a livable world for all humanity and a prosperous future for every nation on Earth. Climate finance is not charity. It's an investment. And there is plenty of money to be made in shifting whole countries to renewable energy. So an investment framework makes sense. Right. Now we just need to get 200 countries to agree to that. And there's one other thing I think we should talk about 
This is the third year in a row that the annual climate conference has been hosted by a fossil fuel exporter. What do you make of that? Well, it's complicated. The COP host country rotates from region to region. It was Eastern Europe's turn this year, and Russia blocked any potential host country that opposed their war on Ukraine. That didn't leave a lot of choices. At the same time, Russia's war on Ukraine has made the EU even more dependent on oil and gas from Azerbaijan. Okay, but the host country also sets each year's agenda. And there's concern that Azerbaijan's leadership might have a serious chilling effect on the process. Already, the New York Times and others have reported that in the lead up to COP29, Azerbaijan has increased its repression of journalists and activists. That's never a good thing. And it's especially not good when we need to have frank conversations about addressing climate change. Right. And at least some in the country appear to be using this climate conference as a business opportunity. The BBC reported that a high-level executive of COP29, a man named Elnur Solnatov, who is also Azerbaijan's deputy energy minister, was recently recorded touting oil and gas investments to a person posing as a potential investor. Obviously, working on oil and gas deals while at a climate conference is hypocritical. But simply being an oil-producing country doesn't sink COP entirely. The head of last year's conference in Dubai was also criticized for cutting oil and gas deals around the conference. But progress was made, including an agreement to transition away from fossil fuels. It was huge news. Right. And the most stunning part of that is that after 28 years of international meetings to discuss the global climate, that was the first time the words fossil fuels made it into the final agreement. Right. That was quite remarkable. I didn't know that at the time. And it happened when a fossil fuel powerhouse was in charge of the meeting. So maybe they need to be involved. These states are complex actors with many different motivations. And I'm not willing to give up on this conference and the process yet. Here's Mukhtar Babayev, Azerbaijan's president of this year's COP, at least talking the talk. Colleagues, we are on the road to ruin. Climate change is already here. From flooded homes in Spain to forest fires in Australia, from rising oceans in the Pacific to barren plains in East Africa. Whether you see them or not, people are suffering in the shadows. They are dying in the dark, and they need more than compassion, more than prayers and paperwork. And they're crying out for leadership and action. So let's see if they actually walk the walk. I'm hoping to be surprised. Coming up, as we mentioned, for years, the richer countries of the world have said they'll give money and financing help to the less developed ones to offset the impacts of climate change. At this year's COP, some of those details will finally be hammered out. It's important because they need it. It's also important because it is the most stress-inducing issue between parties in, in the COP. That's up next when Climate One continues. This week, the 29th Conference of Parties, or COP, is being held in Baku, Azerbaijan. For the third year in a row, the world's most important climate conference is taking place in a country whose largest source of export revenue is fossil fuels. Last year's conference was held in the UAE. And despite nearly 30 years of these meetings and pledges and promises, the UN's recent emissions gap report shows virtually every country is failing to deliver on its promises to cut emissions. It's hard to extricate political interests from the fossil fuel industries that have driven economic growth and wealth creation for the last century. But we simply have to if we want our Earth to remain habitable. Ever since the Paris Agreement was signed at the COP in 2015, the focus of this annual meeting has been on how we can make countries actually do what they promised. How can we get the nations of the world to deliver on their pledges to cut emissions when their economic interests aren't aligned to do so? Todd Stern has some insight on this. He was President Obama's chief climate negotiator for the Paris Agreement, and he's attended several COPs since. He says being on the inside track of discussions between countries doesn't leave much time for interacting with the tens of thousands of advocates, civil society groups, and scientists who also attend the conference. 
At these things, there's people from all over the world, but the diplomats with real power are behind security guards in their UN blue uniforms and metal detectors where regular people can't go. They're really isolated. As a negotiator, when you've got limited number of days to try to hammer out what you're trying to hammer out and to try to keep the thing afloat and to try to have it be as successful as possible, you're so deep into the negotiations. You're meeting with people in in other delegations and you're meeting with your own delegation like all the time. You have some sense of what's going on outside, but not necessarily that much. And sometimes those those worlds overlap. You can see, oh, there's President Macron walking through the crowd, yep. taking selfies yep. with people. Right. The quarters of power are often isolated from pressure, and, and civil society has increased over. But over I time. think less so now. I think if I was a negotiator now, I would hear it, I would be hearing it more than we used to hear it. And one of the concerns that came out of uh, Dubai was, of course, that it is in a petro state and that there now are 100,000 people attend these things. There's also a lot of fossil fuel representatives attending these now. Yes. There's some efforts to, to cap that, to disclose who they are. Are these things being infiltrated by fossil fuel companies trying to slow this thing down and, and muck it up? Well, the only question I have is whether you even use the word infiltrate. I mean, I, it, it, because that suggests sort of quietly under the radar. It, it wasn't quiet and it wasn't under the radar. So they're, they're driving in, through the in, front in, gate. In, yeah. in Dubai, yeah. And um, I mean, again, Dubai, as you said, is a, is a petrol state. And so you, you had a lot of you had a lot of representation from the fossil fuel uh, industry. They it was act- chaired by the head of the National Oil Company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, Sultan Al- al-Jabbar, who I know well from the time that he used to be the lead climate guy. And, and he, at, out of that COP, that, that conference, was the first time to mention ending fossil fuels. Well, yes. And I have a Nixon to China mind about this. That is like huh. Nixon's the only, you know, a Republican yeah. president could open China that a, a petro state would be the best one to say no fossil fuels. Yet other people are saying that he was double dealing and doing oil deals on the side. And there, there's a loophole in the transition from fossil fuels. So what do you think about him and his intentions? Well, I, I actually think he is an extraordinarily able guy. I like him as a person. I think that, you know, it was an unusual sort of place for the, for the cop to end up in, in Dubai, but they're extremely well organized. They're extremely efficient. They did a good job in a lot yep. of ways. Yep. But let me get to the, to the piece that you just asked about regarding fossil fuels. The most important sentence or part of a sentence in the whole outcome last year and it talks about transitioning away from fossil fuels and doing it, not just doing that in, in some like manana way, but transitioning away from fossil fuels in a manner consistent with the fundamental goal of getting to something like net zero by 2050. So there were like quite a number of very savvy climate people who thought this is the beginning of the end for fossil fuels because it was like an extraordinary thing to agree to. Because even the words have been kept out of the agreements. I was about to say, the thing that astonished me, and I've been doing this for a long time, was when I heard that the two words fossil fuels had never been in a climate agreement. I mean, yeah, just that. I mean, the UNFCCC, the the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, was agreed to in 1992. And and this was 2023. And the words fossil fuels had never been uttered. Yeah, that's that's like a, you know, midnight comic joke just right, waiting to right, be told. Right, right, yeah. crazy. So, so quite extraordinary that that was done, but a huge question now about what will actually happen. Will, will, will that pledge be carried out? And I mean, we're not going to know that right away, but I don't know that there's a more important thing that we could be talking about with respect to whether we're going to get where we need to on climate. So it's astonishing those words didn't get in there sooner. It's important that they're in there now. It has symbolic value. Right. And I've read that document many times now, and uh, I don't think there's a legitimate loophole. Are there words that people can try to, to latch on to, to let them kind of get a little bit away from that maybe but I don't think I don't think it adds up because I've heard that Saudi Arabia is very good at getting in there with some lawyers and wordsmiths of course of, and- of course of course but 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 let's just say that when the whole thing was finally done it was a you know a tough negotiation to get there there was a standing ovation in the hall and the only guys who were conspicuously stuck to their chairs 
not getting up and looking very upset were the Saudis. Interesting. So that so we tend to look sometimes at, at oil states as monoliths or right. and and they're they're not. The current cop is called the finance cop. The arc of these things is as you know. There's a problem. Humans are causing it. Paris was like the world came together and said, okay, there's a problem. We need to solve it. Now, all right, how do we solve it? It takes a lot of money. And now it's about moving money. We've gone from the world finally got together $100 billion to move to the global south who are suffering worst and first. They contributed the least to this problem that Americans and rich countries caused. So they've got to $100 billion. Now we hear, okay, you need to get to a trillion dollars a year. Wow, where's that going to come from? So the finance cop in Baku happening now, what are you seeing in terms of mobilizing both government capital, private capital to get to where it needs to go? For starters, I think that finance at some level is the most important issue put in place by the Paris Agreement. I think for a couple of reasons. One is that it's really important that much, much larger flows of capital go from, let's say, the global north to the global south, right? the developed countries to developing. You just need that from the point of view of those countries needing to develop in the right way. Lots of them don't produce much in the way of, uh, of fossil fuels now, but but that's going to be growing by leaps and bounds. Places like Africa are going to become big emitters. So the North needs to say, here, we can give some money so you can leapfrog fossil fuels, go solar, go wind. So I think that it, it's important because they need it. It's also important because it is the most it's the most stress-inducing issue between parties in, in the COP. All the way back to Copenhagen in 2009, pledged by developed countries to mobilize. So it could be from their own pocket, could be from um, investments from the private sector if they had something to do with helping to make those investments happen. So $100 billion a year by 2020. Paris comes along in 2015. They say, okay, we're, it's not going to stop in 2020. We're going to extend that to 2025. And then in 2025, we're going to decide what the new number is to, to replace 100. And it won't be less than 100. That's what was agreed to in Paris. And there, there was already tension because the developed countries didn't actually make the, make the 2020 deadline. It took two or three years after yep. that to get to 100. To 100. But now there have also been all sorts of serious studies about how much money is actually needed to deal with this problem worldwide, right, to, uh, to get, get, the, get the investments we need for to build green technology, to build resilience for vulnerable countries and all of that. And, and some very good reports. And the numbers are a trillion, two trillion, whatever, a lot. Look, I mean, no democracy is going to send taxpayer money to overseas to non-taxpayers, non-citizens, right? It's not going to come out of right. the national so, treasuries to do so this. So there needs to be some number successor that is agreed to in the COP this year that parties can say, okay, yes, the hundred is going to grow to something. It's not going to grow to a trillion. I mean, it, it just, you're not going to get a hundred billion to a trillion like that. It just doesn't work like that. But here's the thing. The money has got to, including all the way up to the trillion levels, it, it got to get there, but it's not going to get there through the body of the UNFCCC or of the Paris regime. The places where, there, where this is being talked about most f fruitfully, most uh, usefully, I think, in my judgment, uh, has been in the G20 meetings over the last few years. And, and the, the, the best one of the G20 reports that have, have emerged uh, happened last year, the G20 in India in the, in the fall. And they put out a, a report called the, the uh, Triple Agenda. If you, if you want to read, just read the executive summary of the volume two of the Triple Agenda, and it's excellent. And it gets, it gets into the nitty gritty and basically what it's about is radical reform of the World Bank and the associated multilateral development banks like Asia, Africa, Latin America, and so forth, to, first of all, get more capital from the so-called shareholders, meaning the big countries, meaning the United States and Europe and, all, and elsewhere, some more, but not a huge amount more, but to start using their capital, using their resources, which are considerable, in a very different way in a way which is, which is significantly oriented toward allowing uh, investment by the private sector to be de-risked, to lower the risk. Right, so private sector 
where the big money really is. Right, right. Because a trillion dollars is a lot for any government. It's not a lot on Wall Street and in, in financial markets. What I hear you saying is World Bank and Asia Development Bank, the money's there. It just needs to flow differently and be allocated differently with climate in mind and yeah. help support. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's trillions sitting in those banks. No, I'm saying the, those banks have the capacity to, to unlock. You, to yeah. unlock. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 that I think is important. And there's other banks. There's there there are big national development banks. The National Development Bank of Brazil, for example, is huge, and and there are many around the world. And if you could actually get the right, you know, group of people and the right countries fully engaged on this, and and the leadership of the World Bank fully engaged, I think you could go a long way toward getting there. You're not going to get from a hundred billion to a trillion overnight, but I think you could start getting hundreds of billions in a, in a relatively short period of time and rising. And I think that's what we need. That's going to make the Paris regime work better, and that's going to have everybody rowing in the, in the same direction. A key to this process, you know, to Paris was when U.S. and China, President Xi and President Obama sat down and said, we can may agree, disagree on lots of things. We can we can uh, work on uh, climate together. That opened the door to the Paris Climate Agreement, which which then brought all the countries together. You know, China has been classified as a developing country. Now it's you know becoming a global economic superpower. But the U.S. China it still classifies itself as a developing country. Yes, because maybe <laughs> nobody in the world agrees, but it still classifies itself that it's way. The humble, yeah, they like the benefits of being the end. They want to yeah. be the biggest economy in the world and still be and still be a developing country. But anyway, go ahead. So the the, the economy's changed a lot. So have U.S. China relations are in a very different place yes. than in, in 2014 when Obama and Xi sat down. Relations are at the worst in, in decades, you know, fears over Taiwan. You know, one thing Republicans and Democrats agree on is bashing China. Um, so how is that affecting climate and U.S.-China climate collaboration, given how tense the relationships are? Yeah, well, it, th that's a, a really good and, and, and important question. Just to kind of go back for a moment in the 2014 agreement came out of a 10-month secret um, back and forth uh, negotiation and when it was announced, the two leaders literally walking down a red carpet in the Great Hall of the People, mm -hmm. it was like quite spectacular, the world was shocked. Negotiators were shocked. The press was shocked. Nobody knew this was coming. It was the headline of every paper around the world. It was a big S deal and it opened the but way to Paris. all of a sudden, yeah. it was like we could actually get this done. And by the time countries came to Paris, there were like I think 180 or more had put forward their proposed uh, their their proposed reductions themselves. So that was a huge big moment. Now it's a lot, as you said, it's a lot harder. Um, the relationship is much more strained and tense uh, in a variety of ways. Um, and I think that you know, just as I said all the way back in two thousand nine, that that climate change can help provide some positive interaction between our countries. And you're saying that climate can be one area we, where U.S. and China have common interest to act together. Yes, I, I think that that is right. And I think it's super important because, you know, we're, we're sort of still the two 800-pound gorillas in the world. And, uh, and uh, it is important for China to move in the right direction for the world, too. China, China is now 30% of uh, of global emissions, the, more than the entire the entire developed world put together. Yeah, so they're they're the biggest current emitter. The other one, though, here of course is India, which also you know is a big climate <laughs> gorilla. Um, so to address India because that's one that I guess I worry about more because I think China is such a clean tech leader. They they see their industrial leadership in the 21st century, leading on batteries, leading on solar. Like China, yeah. there's an economic case for China to go forward in a clean way. India, I'm less sure. Well, no, I, that's absolutely true about China. So China is the, is the biggest emitter. They have way too much coal, all sorts of things like that. They're also the leader on, on, on clean tech. So you're totally right about that. I think India has a great deal of potential uh, to land on the right side of this. Uh, and uh, Modi has put forward some very far-reaching uh, goals, um, by which they're, I think, working hard to, uh, to, to follow. They also have way too big a coal economy, and coal is really deeply embedded in the use of coal in, uh, in the Indian political culture. But 
I sort of look more optimistically uh, at India. I think at the moment it's very hard to get them away from coal, but I think they will they will ride up the, the high tech path, and they will not want to become singularly dependent on. China for that path. Sure, sure. So what do you expect to come out of this current COP this year? Um, a lot of people have low expectations. A lot of people aren't going. Even some of the you know major banks are not going. And people are talking a lot more about Brazil next year. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that this finance issue that we already talked about is is going to really predominate in, uh, in Baku and in, in Azerbaijan. Hopefully it's going to be successful enough that there will be some kind of solution on the uh, the words will get put together so that we can move forward on the finance issue. I doubt it that people are going to look back at this as a big historic cop. How and about Brazil next year? That's where people say I think that's- Brazil next year. So the, first of all, the Brazilian level of, 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 of kind of skill of uh, the, the um, Brazilian diplomats is of a very high order. They're really good at, at, at doing things like this. The money issue, I think, won't be finished. It'll Hopefully, we get over the hurdle this year. But, but apart from the money is, it's, 2025 is the time for all countries to put in their new targets to so reduce their emissions. And it's going to be looked at by the world quite legitimately as a very important moment and this is all really important things and the, you know, the shapes of certain graphs and, and charts going down or, or flattening, uh, and yet it has tremendous human implications. I'm wondering, in all your years doing this, uh, in these negotiations, talking about these numbers that have very scary implications, yeah. do you ever just feel like, is there a moment that really like brought you to tears or you get a lump in your stomach with, with what, what's at stake? You know, we saw recently a weather caster who just was moved to tears. I saw that. Right. And have you had a similar moment? Is that brother caster that you saw? No, I, I I haven't had a similar moment like that. But I sure I get I, I get concerned. Let, let me tell you how I look at the climate landscape right now because it, it's it's consistent with your with your question. I think there are three big elements that I see in our landscape right now. One is that the scientific analysis as well as the actual impacts around the world are coming faster and harder at us than anybody ever imagined, including all of those scientists back some years ago. It, yeah. It's people who thought that, oh, the scientists are exaggerating. Not at all. Scientists were always being quite careful. And what has, in fact, happened is I mean, we're having... They're conserv they were conservative they're, compared to what we've seen. There is biblical weather happening all over the world on yeah. a regular basis. And I won't... Uh, I, we, yeah. I'm not People gonna, know what they are. So bad things are happening faster. So that's Good number things, one. Yeah. That's number one. Number two of the three factors is the progress in clean technology, which has been nothing short of spectacular. It's unbelievable, far, far, multiple times faster than any of the best modelers and, and, uh, and analysts around the world had ever imagined. Wind and solar and, and batteries and electric vehicles and heat pumps and all of those things are, are, have come at an amazing rate. So the costs just dropping exponentially, the uptake rising exponentially. And this is going to keep happening. The cheapest electricity in the world by far now is solar. And so... You're going to see that happening. That's very encouraging. If there wasn't a third factor that I'm going to mention, I would look and say, you know, we, we have half a chance to get to, to something like net zero in something like 2050. The third factor uh, is the obstacles. And the biggest obstacle is the fossil fuel industry, both for what they do and for whom they influence, which which our leaders all over the world. We've got to get over that, and that's a big hurdle. So, so I don't, I don't get choked up in the way that that uh, that weatherman on TV did. But there is real reason to get to get very concerned. I, I try. Do you get to, mad and angry at the fossil fuel companies who are putting their own profits against uh, over global humanity? I mean. I think it's easy to get to, to, to yes. I mean, I know you're a diplomat to, and you're trained no, to not no, have emotions. No, no, no. I mean, uh, sure. It, it, it's, it, I, what, 
In the best of circumstances, if we really were to meet those net zero targets, we would go from a world where about 80% of primary energy comes from the fossil fuel industry to a world where about 15 or 20% came in 2050. It would still, they'd still be there. And each we, country, we and each company wants that. to be the, in each country and each company wants to be the one producing part of that 80. That's right. And someone That's else right. have to give so up So this is the biggest challenge. It, it's both why that sentence going back to, to, to Dubai was so important that we're going to transition away in a matter consistent with our 2050 targets. It's why it was so important and why it's so going to be so difficult <laughs> to meet those pledges. And to do that, you're going to need a really powerful change sort of in hearts and minds. You can't just wave a wand. Politicians will do things differently when they see that doing things the same way they always have could cost them their jobs. They don't feel that yet. Todd Stern is former United States Special Envoy for Climate Change and author of the new book, Landing the Paris Climate Agreement, How It Happened, Why It Matters, and What Comes Next. After the break, we'll talk to an activist who's skipping this year's climate conference, partly because of repression by the host government in Azerbaijan. It's not the only place where we have power. It is one moment that we must then continue outside of it. That's up next when Climate One continues. Today, we're talking about the Conference of Parties, or COP, the global climate conference that takes place once a year. Tens of thousands of people attend the conference, including heads of state and industry. And activists are also present, lobbying leaders, paying attention to what they promise, and educating the wider public about how climate change is affecting us all. Mitzi Janelle Tan is a climate justice activist based in the Philippines who's attended several COPs. She understands deeply how all this high-level posturing and negotiation connects to the people feeling the impacts of climate change on the ground. She's experienced those impacts firsthand since she was a child growing up outside Manila. I remember just being stuck at home with no electricity for days, and you could hear the winds outside just howling, and the rains were really strong. You could hear trees falling, and you were just always very scared that the tree would fall. On us, we would have candlelit dinners because there was no electricity, and we would be listening to a battery powered radio to try to hear how our relatives were in different cities if we needed to evacuate at some point. And I remember waking up to like floods in, in some of our places and, and mm-hmm. not knowing what to do, being afraid if it was going to go into our room and like drown in our sleep. Yeah, that's very scary, I think, especially as a younger person, right? Mm -hmm. How did that differ from what you were learning about in school in terms of climate change as kind of a concept? It's interesting because in school, we were taught about climate change, but it was in science class in a very practical manner where this is happening. The carbon dioxide emissions are rising, but not that we can do something about it, not that we were already experiencing it, how it looked like for us. It was about melting ice caps and polar bears. It was very technical and foreign and alienating and more of a matter of a fact than something that needs and can be changed Mm. and that can be changed by young people. It wasn't empowering. It wasn't contextualized to our experience. It felt very removed. And so it felt like it wasn't what we were experiencing. Right. Not not giving you a sense of agency or mm-hmm. or your own ability to yeah change the outcome. That's interesting. So the Philippines is consistently ranked as one of the most climate vulnerable countries. So today, what impacts are you seeing that are more intense, perhaps different from what they were, you know, 20, 30 years ago? So in the past 20 years, we have had the highest number of extreme weather events. So what I saw growing up, we just got more and more of that, more extreme weather events in the sense of stronger rains and stronger floods. And even during the summer period, we would have typhoons that were so strong that they matched the rainy season typhoons. And um, the typhoon season has just expanded. If it before it was just around September, now it's from September to November to December. We're kind of just constantly expecting these really extreme weather events. And now every typhoon that we experience, the impacts are so strong. Before, you know, 
it does rain. That is a bit normal. But then people are able to bounce back much quicker. But now it's just happening over and over and over. And with the lack of adaptation also, and a lot of our green spaces and our forests being cut down and being removed, the soil isn't soaking up the water as much anymore. And so the floods are actually getting worse. And now we're also seeing the heat waves a lot more. Like school was canceled because of the heat waves, because it was too hot to go to school, because our government changed our educational calendar so that our actual summertime is in March, April, May, around those times. And we used to start school in June. But then to be in line with Europe and the U.S., they made our school start in August and June, July is now our break. So now during the hottest time of the year in the Philippines, kids have to go to school. And during the heat waves, it was just too hot. The schools couldn't handle it. And so they had to send kids home or like just cancel classes. Wow. So your Instagram profile describes you as a Filipina anti-imperialist climate justice activist guided by love, joy, and collective world building. Mm -hmm. So first, how do you see the intersection between colonialism, capitalism, and climate vulnerability playing out in the Philippines? Hmm. To start on the global scale, even the IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports now say that colonialism is a reason why countries are vulnerable to the climate crisis. And we see this on different levels. Uh, on the capitalism side, we see that global emissions started to rise more rapidly during the 1800s, during the Industrial Revolution. And then when we look at how the industrialization process happened, it came from taking resources from the lands, from the global south, from the colonized peoples. And so there you already start to see the interplay of how that process of colonialization led to the over-extraction of resources that have destroyed our natural ecosystems, our biodiversity, and in that process made us more vulnerable to the climate crisis because the forests are being cut down, there are quarries, there are large mining sites, and that's causing floods and landslides that's being caused by the emissions that, that's using these resources. And so it starts to loop into each other. And additionally on that, you also see in the imperialism side, especially the militarization aspect, where the U.S. military trains the Philippine military and they train the Philippine military in counterterrorism and how the military in the Philippines uses counterterrorism is to attack environmental defenders, indigenous peoples who are fighting against environmentally destructive projects. And that's why the Philippines is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for environmental defenders and activists, because they say that anyone who is fighting for human rights, especially usually the ones who are going up against the ones that are taking the resources from the land. So the indigenous peoples, our small farmers, our small fisher folk, they tag them as terrorists. And there you see that culture of impunity coming from our previous colonizers, the U.S. Wow. I just have to sit with that for a second. That's a lot. Um, so. Considering yourself as an anti-imperialist activist, how do you feel moving through these United Nations conferences where the most powerful players, arguably, are still these imperial mm -hmm. or formerly imperial powers? Mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult because you see how the structures in place are still there in small things and in big things. In small things in the sense that who has the biggest resources to send a big team of negotiators? It's the Global North countries. And what that means practically is that they can keep going on and on and just switching out their people throughout the negotiations. But countries mm -hmm. from smaller island states and smaller countries have less people to send because they have less resources, which then means at the end of the day, it's like past midnight, they're tired and they won't hold the line as strongly because, yeah, we'll, we'll give in to what the Global North is saying. And they have a lot more resource and a lot more energy. And then you also see the other parts where um, the U.S. has been for a long time very concretely like saying that the loss and damage fund is not something that we need. And then at the very end, suddenly saying, oh, OK, we do need the loss and damage fund, but we can't afford it. How the U.S., one <laughs> of the largest countries in the, and richest countries in the world, say that they can't afford to give anything into the loss and damage fund. Let's explain quickly what that is for someone who may not know. Can you explain what the loss and damage fund is? Mm -hmm. So... Part of the climate policy work that we're fighting for is making sure that there's finance to ensure that we actually get somewhere because we recognize that we need money in order to adapt to the climate crisis. We need money in order to mitigate and, and that means to bring down emissions and to move away from fossil fuels and transition to renewable energies. 
and we need money for the losses and damages that have already been experienced. So for the longest time, there have already been an adaptation and mitigation fund, but there was no loss and damage fund. The loss and damage fund being actually put in place signifies that, hey, the climate crisis is already here, has already been happening. Losses and damages have already been happening. And there are things that we can no longer adapt to at this point and at this stage because we've acted too late. And so they're in a way a form of reparations to the climate crises that people have already been experiencing. Who brought that notion forward? Who was successful in advocating for the creation of the Loss and Damage Fund? So it took a very long time, but it started with small island nation states and countries like the Philippines really pushing it over and over and over. And it was only in Egypt in COP27 when it was finally implemented. And then in Dubai the last year, that was when money started to roll in. And now they're going to have this COP, they're going to have the discussions of how the money's going to come in, who's going to pay, who's going to receive the money. And so it just continues that conversation that's really needed. Right. So this conference of parties now underway is being billed as the finance COP. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are your hopes that this will jumpstart more money actually flowing to developing countries that need these funds to adapt, to repair, to prepare for worse outcomes? I expect faster action in ensuring that the finance that comes in is in the form of grants and not loans, because a lot of climate finance flowing in right now from the global north to the global south is in the form of loans, which means we get stuck in a debt trap and that's worse for our economy. And it's almost like if we were two people in cars and you bumped into me and you broke my car and you're like, you know what, I'll give you a loan to fix your car, but there's interest. And now I'm suddenly in loan for you for destroying something that I owned. That's what's happening, really. And so at this COP, we really need to make sure that we have that and we, that the money that's happening is additional and not just like taken from a different pot, either from adaptation, from mitigation, and then transferred into um, loss and damage because we do need all of it. And when we say climate finance and when we say reparations, we don't say that normal people of the global north should be paying this. They shouldn't be the ones shouldering that. But if you look at how much money is going into fossil fuel subsidies, if you look at how much money the fossil fuel companies are still gaining, they're profiting so much money, they're the ones who should be paying up reparations because they're the ones directly responsible for the climate crisis. Right. It's a handful of companies, really, mm -hmm. um, that are responsible for the bulk of the emissions. So you're not attending this year's conference. And I believe that's partly because of the environment surrounding it, mm -hmm. not actually the negotiations themselves. Azerbaijan has increased its repression of journalists and activists leading up to this COP. So tell us a bit about your decision not to go and what also you've experienced in the last couple conference of parties you've attended. So the last couple of con conference of parties that we've attended have been in majority oil or coal or gas countries. So you have um, Egypt and then Dubai and now we have Azerbaijan. And in all those countries, democratic spaces were just so limited and really repressive. And the human rights violations were so intense. And in the previous COPs, we were able to really link up with the human rights activists of the country and really bring that message in into the COP and say, hey, this is what climate justice is. It's not just about the emissions rising. It's also about the injustices that are happening, usually because it's fueled by fossil fuels. Like if we look at a lot of war and occupation, and militarization, it's because some entity wants resources from the land and there are other people who are trying to fight it back against that. And with Azerbaijan, we're seeing the genocide of Armenians. We're seeing extreme human rights abuses within their own country, really just a silencing of anyone who's fighting for justice. And I do believe that the people who are at the COP right now, the activists who are there, are doing their best to still amplify that message to really still bring human rights and peace and justice into this COP because we need to do it at every COP. I've just decided that for this year, I'm putting my energy into mobilizing outside the COP and getting people to realize that, hey, this COP is the COP that's talking about finance. We need to make sure that we get that climate finance from the global north to the global south. And when it gets to the global south in our countries, we actually hold our national leaders accountable so that the money actually goes to the most marginalized because it could still also get stuck in the governments where a lot, there's a lot of corruption. And so it's, it's doing that at the same time. And this year I've decided to focus on my work at home. So in past years, as when you have attended as an activist there in those spaces, 
for people who haven't been to COP, there is sort of the core negotiations between different teams from different countries. Then there's these sort of outer rings, outer circles of civil society, activism, um, mm -hmm. nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera. Elsewhere in this episode, we speak with Todd Stern, who was the U.S. lead negotiator in the Paris Agreement. And he says that when he was in that role as a lead negotiator, he was so entrenched in these nonstop negotiations that he didn't really interact with activists and advocates that were on this outside. So what effect do you think that work of activism and advocacy has at a COP? I think it also depends who you're talking to, because there are some negotiators that we've been able to sit down with, have conversations with, and get information from and say, hey, okay, these are the countries that we need to push a little bit more on. These are the countries who are listening more. These are the countries who are at this position. And we're also seeing that uh, it's true that the negotiation space is really like separate and they do that on purpose also so that civil society gets distracted almost and forgets that we're supposed to be feeding into what's happening there. And that's why it's important to have civil society inside, talking to the policy uh, policymakers, following the negotiations and feeding that back into the outside movement within COP and then the outside movement, feeding that back into the world. Because the decisions that are made at COP, they're not necessarily going to be implemented unless we can hold them accountable at home. We need to make sure that whatever they're saying at the COPs, whatever promises they're making, either in small rooms and small discussions with you or on the stages where they're making promises, when we go back home, we say, hey, you said this at this COP. Where are the policies that actually implement it? How do we actually get to the promise that you said? And that's the key role of activists and civil society in these spaces. Because if, if we weren't watching at all, how much worse would it be? We're seeing that every year, so much fossil fuel lobbyists are coming into these spaces because they know that this is a space that can really take away their power. So we can't give them that space and leave it to them completely. To your point, in terms of holding these countries accountable for the promises they make at this conference, the UN's recent emissions gap report shows virtually every country failing to deliver on its promises it's been three years since Greta Thunberg famously called out climate negotiators for engaging in blah, 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 just talk, empty promises. Mm -hmm. What do you think it will take for that to really change? I think it's already changing. Countries are realizing that they now need to lie in order to keep going. So what we saw is before countries and fossil fuel companies, for example, would just outright deny the climate crisis, say it's not a problem. And now it's being pushed to, yeah, we're doing something, we're doing something, we're doing something. So we just need to keep pushing. And at the same time, we're seeing other initiatives alongside the COP process that complement the Paris Agreement, like the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is a treaty that's been signed on now with 14 nations, being written mostly by Pacific Island nations, calling for a non-proliferation or basically no more expansion and no more new infrastructure of fossil fuels, a phase out of fossil fuels into renewable energy. And doing that all in a just transition so that it's a global plan to a global problem and ensuring that workers don't get left behind in the process. And what's beautiful about this treaty is it's patterned after treaties in the past that have worked like the Landmines Treaty, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, where a smaller group of countries come together and in a much faster and more efficient way create a treaty because it's not consensus-based. And like the COP processes, which are consensus-based, which means that if the global north or some country, one of them doesn't want fossil fuels in there, we have to, to suffer all of it because of that. But because this is a treaty with mostly global south countries signing on to it first and creating that, then we're going to have a treaty that actually is going to prioritize people and planet. We've now also have Colombia sign on to this treaty, which is major because it is a coal producing country and hoping that some other global north countries will sign on as well. Yeah, we recently spoke with Sapora Berman, who was involved in creating the, non, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And she was saying that exactly as you said, it can be powerful with only a fraction of the world's countries. You just need enough support mm -hmm. and then it becomes its own source of pressure. You've been going to these annual climate conferences for three years. You know, we've seen protest signs at past COPs that say, how many cops does it take to arrest climate change? Um, it can feel sometimes, I think, exhausting to have a, yet another conference. What do you think? How many more of these can you, can you take? <laughs> 
I don't know, honestly. I see, um, and I've talked to people who have been going to every cup. And I was like, 29 cups. That's a lot. And I talk to them and they say they've seen change. And it's important to be there. It's important to take up this space. But also remember that not all of us should necessarily be here. It's not the only place you do your work. It's not the only place where we have power. It is one moment that we must then continue outside of it. And it's one moment in the climate space that we need to take advantage of when it's there. But we can't put all our hopes into it. But I don't know how many more I can take. Other people that I've talked to have gone for a few and then will take a break and then come back. And I think maybe that's that's the more sustainable way for me also because it is incredibly tiring because it's just two weeks every day of nonstop engagement with civil society, with people, but with also with politicians and with, with negotiators and with media. And it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot in your body. And something that we should be incorporating in our climate activism is realizing that we're just like the earth. There are cycles. There are cycles and periods of rest. And so we should be honoring our bodies and allowing us to rest as well. Mitzi Janelle Tan is a climate justice activist based in Manila, Philippines. Thank you so much for joining us on Climate One. Thank you so much, Ariana. And that's our show. Thanks for listening. Access our entire archive of podcasts on our website, climateone.org. And please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or a review. You can do this right now from your device. Thanks for your support. Climate One is a production of the Commonwealth Club. Our team includes Brad Marshland, Jenny Park, Ariana Brocious, Austin Cologne, Megan Basilia, Ben Testani, and Jenny Lawton. Our theme music is by George Young. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>